Good evening, everybody. Glad you're here with us. And uh, take out your Bibles and turn to the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi. So we are finishing quite a journey, to be honest with you, right? We started in the book of Genesis and here uh, completing now the Old Testament tonight. Um, I don't know how many of you, at least how many of you here with us in Genesis? Let's see. Awesome. Good for you. That's a long time. I think like eight years. That's quite an accomplishment right there. So um, I think you missed a few Wednesdays, though. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know I didn't miss any of them because I made it. Now, we might have skipped a few if I was out of town. But um, anyway, uh, hopefully you're here in Malachi. Malachi. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight that whenever we have difficulties or challenges or disappointments, we can run to the Father. How encouraging that is. And often we're running to you because maybe we drifted away. Uh, we see this here in the book of Malachi. The children of Israel once again drifted from you and you had to send your prophet to get them back on track. And Lord, we thank you that we have your word that keeps us on track. That if we would just be daily spending time in your word, you're there reminding us, I love you, I care for you, come back to me, change these things. And also we find words of encouragement. You're encouraging us along the way. Keep running. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. And we just thank you, Lord, for the confidence we have in a heavenly father that is perfect to us and loves us so much. So tonight, Lord, we just want to sit at your feet and learn of you uh, through the prophet Malachi. Bless your word tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. So this is the last book of the minor prophets, and he is... <clears throat> the last of the three post-exile prophets. We said there again, there are only three of them that prophesied after the children came back to Jerusalem from their Babylonian captivity. Now, the first two, of course, when we've already seen were Haggai and Zechariah, and they prophesied actually together around 520 B.C. But Malachi, <clears throat> he prophets during the uh, prophesies during the time of Nehemiah. And that's about a hundred years later. So by this time as Malachi is the last prophet to prophesy, uh, the temple has been rebuilt. The city has been reestablished. Uh, even under the direction of uh, Nehemiah, the walls have been rebuilt. And in fact, uh, Nehemiah was the governor of Jerusalem. Um, however, after Nehemiah served his term as governor, he then returned back to Persia. Of course, Medo-Persian was now in control. This is now 432 B.C. And he needed to report to Artaxerxes. And he was there for a while. Now, in his absence, once again, the children of Israel began to flounder in their walks. They neglected the temple. They set aside the scriptures. Um, they began to live like the world. And so understand, Nehemiah would eventually return back and he would have a second term as a governor here. But in his absence, God raised up Malachi to turn the hearts of the people back to God. Now, let me say this then. Malachi represents God's last word to his people until the New Testament. 400 years of silence after Malachi, and then you have John the Baptist coming on the scene. So that's quite a while. So Malachi is God's last word to his people until God sends the living word, Jesus Christ, which is pretty awesome. Now, he does have some important prophecies for us concerning the Lord's first and second coming. And uh, his name means messenger of God. And truly, he lived up to his name being that last voice in the Old Testament. So let's jump in to the book, chapter one, the burden of the Lord <clears throat> to Israel by Malachi. And notice what God begins by saying, even though he's going to rebuke them, he says, I have loved you. Isn't that something? Just before God rebukes them, he assures them of his love. Isn't that like the Lord? And the Lord does love us, even though he has to uh, chasten us. Again, Hebrews 12, 6, right? Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He loves us and he'll chasten us, and, but he always affirms his love for us. So this is what God does through the prophet Malachi. Then he gets to business. Now, he, he, they said, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? God, do you really love us? I mean, if you loved us, you wouldn't be disciplining us. But God says, oh no, I need to do that. 
Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. And you can read the account in the book of Genesis how God did reject Esau. But understand, God did so because Esau rejected God. This wasn't some arbitrary God saying, well, I just, I hate you, Esau. That's not true. There are people that like to tell you that. No, if you read the story of Esau, he was a, a worldly man that turned from God. And God not only punished Esau, but the territory of Edom where he lived. So he says in verse 4, even though Edom has said we've been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places, the God, God says, no, they may build, but I'm going to throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see and you shall say the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. So God would judge Esau as well as that nation. And his point, Malachi's point, is really this. Just as God was magnified in the judgment of Esau, so he would be magnified in the judgment and discipline of his people if they do not repent. And the first thing now God gets into in dealing with them is their shallow worship. Verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If I then the father am the father... Where is my honor, God says. If I am the master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name. So he begins with the priests, but it also trickles down to the people. They had called God their father, but they didn't obey the Lord. And I think of Jesus' words in Luke six forty six, which is to any and all. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do the things that I say? Verse 6, you say, in what way have we despised your name? What do you mean we're, we're being hypocritical in our worship? What do you mean? Well, God says, verse 7, you offered defiled food on my altar. You, you put meat or sacrifice on the altar, but it's defiled. You're, you're just going through the motion. Your, your worship isn't honoring. It's really watered down. But you say, in what way do we defile you in our offerings? God's saying the table of the Lord is contemptible when you offer the blind as a sacrifice. Is that not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is that not evil? God clearly specified in the Old Testament, when you bring an offering to God, you bring the best. You don't bring the, the leftovers. You don't bring the scraps. And so God says in verse 8, hey, why don't you offer that kind of offering to your governor? Would he be pleased would he, with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord? So if you were to give a gift to a dignitary and, and, and you wanted to bring a present to a period, and would you say, hey, honey, we, what, what do we got left in the house? What, what can we give him? Oh, look at that over there. We don't use that. Let's take that, wrap it up, and give him to him for a gift. No, I don't think he'd be impressed by that. But isn't this something that God's people do? I mean, think about it. We, we can possibly give God our leftovers. You know, I, I've, got, I've got a little extra time this week. Maybe I can give a little bit to God. Or I have some money left over after I purchased all the things I need, and maybe I'll give a little bit to God. And I have found over the years that God's people sometimes give God their leftovers. Hey, you know what? This piano is all worn out. We've had it for 30 years. We're going to buy a new one. May just call the church and see if they need that old piano. I'm buying myself a new lawnmower. Man, we get rid of this. Maybe the church can use this old lawnmower. Rarely has anybody ever said, you know what? I was going to buy myself a brand new van, but I think you guys need one. Why don't you take this brand new van and I'll, I'll take your old one? No one, no one does that. Very rare, right? I'm not saying we need any of the things, by the way, so... Just saying that word I need. But it's possible for us to just think of God like, well, okay, you know, we, we give him our leftovers. So we get them from our own life of our time, our talent, and our treasure. God says in verse 9, but now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. Why? Because he's saying your actions are sinful. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably? Verse 10, who is there among you uh, who would shut the door so that he would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? 
I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. You're putting fire on the altar. You're putting an, uh, an animal on it, but it's, it's, you're trivialize, uh, trivializing it. It's not important to you. You're, you're, you're putting meat on the grill, but look what you're putting on there. I was thinking about this. What if you went to your favorite steakhouse? And he said, man, I'd like a, I'd like a ribeye, man. Make it medium rare. I'm looking forward to it. And then they come on your plate and they bring it. Well, we didn't have that, but we got some armadillo roadkill here. Would you like to take that? Are you kidding me? So why would we do that with God? Why would we do that with God? Imagine God right here. He has done everything up until this point again for his people. He brought them back from Babylonian captivity. He held back their, their enemies now. He's enabled them to rebuild their city, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple. Beyond that, they're living now in new homes, new crops. It's fruitful. And in the face of all this graciousness, they're repaying God back with roadkill and their sacrifice. Wow. It's like a slap in God's face. I, I think that when we think about all the goodness we have, I, I think of it quite often, to be honest with you. I was meeting with a group of guys earlier this morning. We were talking about, think about how God is so good to us. And yet we often take it for granted. Now, moving on, God makes this astounding prophecy. From the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name's going to be great among the Gentiles. Well, that's astounding. He's speaking to the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered in my name, a pure offering, undefiled. For my name will be great among the nations, not just Israel, everywhere. Now, of course, we have seen this come to pass. And we've been studying it on Sundays in the book of Acts, seeing the birth church, uh, the church birth, and then moving down to Gentiles and down into Antioch and Paul taking the gospel to the known world. Amazing. And we're the benefactors of that. Most of us are, are Gentiles. But now he comes back to this problem. He says, listen, you just think you're something special. I'm reaching the whole world. But then he comes back to the problem. But you refrain my sacrifice. The table of the Lord is defiled. It's fruit. It's food. It's, it's contemptible. Beyond that, you also say, ah, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you, you bring the stolen, the lame, the sick. Thus you bring that kind of offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? And of course, the answer is no. But the problem is this. First of all, they're bringing their leftovers to God. But then over a period of time, their continual worship and sacrifice to God became a drudgery. Oh, the weariness. I mean, it should be a delight to worship God. It should be a delight to give to God. Instead, it became a duty. And again, we need to ask ourselves, could that be us as we as time goes on and you serve the Lord, I mean, it's one of the things that we have to confront ourselves with. Because we might fall in the trap and say, ah, do I really have to go to church again? I, I, could, just, I could just put it on the internet. But you know what? My favorite team is playing tonight. I, I, I got time. I'll put it on a little square. I'll check on it every once in a while, whatever. Or man, I got an usher today. I got to serve in children's church today. Man, Really? Listen, any service we get to do for God, and we need to remind ourselves this, we don't have to do it. We get to do it. We say, my wife is saying that because we say that in our house all the time. We remind ourselves in our home all the time, and we remind our kids that too. We don't have to. We get to do this. We get to do it. I agree with D.L. Moody said, uh, he said this, I may get tired of the work, but I never get tired of the work. I can get tired in it, but not of it. And so let me encourage those of you who are serving hard, getting tired. I understand that. Galatians 6, 9 is God's word for us. Do not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season you will reap if you faint not. God does reward those who work hard, but we never want to fall into that trap of drudgery. And then he concludes, verse 14, but cursed be the deceiver who has his flock a male and takes a vow, but the Lord sacrifices what is, or he, but he sacrificed the Lord what is blemished. For I am the king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Don't say, well, I'd like to give God my best, but I promised I was going to do this, and you give him your leftovers. So this is the first thing that, that Malachi confronts the people with. Now, we come to chapter 2, and he speaks out against the priest, and of course, rightly so, because they are the ones to set the example. And he says, oh, now, O priest, this commandment is for you. 
If you will not hear, if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've, I've even cursed them already because you don't take it to heart. It, it's already beginning to happen. Behold, I'll rebuke your descendants and, and, and I spared, spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feast, and one will take uh, you away with it. Now, that's a pretty graphic scene. What he's saying is, you know, if they, when they brought a sacrifice, if there was any excrement of the animal, they had to remove that and not put it on the altar and take it outside of the camp. And God says, you know that excrement that's taken outside? I just rubbed that over your face. That's disgusting, right? God, that's how God feels about it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. I've blessed you. I gave you the privilege of being priests before the people. My covenant was with them, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him and he might fear me. So he did fear me and was reverent before my name. I, I gave the Levites the privilege of worshiping before me. The law of truth, verse 6, in his mouth and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. So God says, I blessed him because he blessed me walking in my truth. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge and people should seek the law from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. So this is a good word for any of us in leadership. We are to be those that set an example for people to follow. But he indicts them, verse eight. You've departed from the way. You've caused many to stumble at the law. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So what a tragedy because people take their cues from the leadership and, and this was a serious accusation. Now, you might say, well, I'm glad I'm not a Levite or a priest or a pastor, thank God. But you know what? You're a leader anyway. All of us are leaders in one capacity over another. If you're married, you should be a leader to your loved one being an example to them. If you're a parent, you're a leader and an example to your children. If you're an employee, you should be a leader and an example to your employees. If you're an employee, you should be an example to the other employees. Either way, we're, we're to set an example. Therefore, I've also made you contemptible and base before all the people because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the father? So they had profaned God's law. They had not followed through with all the laws that God had given them. And now Malachi confronts another problem within the people. And this is the issue of marital purity. Uh, the people had marred their marriages in two ways. One in marrying unbelievers, people in that area that had settled in the area where they, when they came back, and then uh, unbiblical divorces. First, in marrying unbelievers, verse 11, Judah has dwelt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves, that's marriage. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. So there was intermarrying with those that worshiped other gods. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Now, God <clears throat> loves marriage. He calls it in verse 11 a holy institution. Um, and it's important to God. Why is marriage important to God? Well, because it's an example of his love for his people. In fact, it, it's an example of Christ's love for his bride, the church. In Ephesians 5.31, it says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and they become one flesh. And then he says this, and this is a great mystery, because I speak concerning Christ and his church. So when we give our lives to Christ, we become one with him. Christ is the groom and we become the bride. And listen, Jesus cherishes his bride. He sanctifies his bride. He protects his bride. He died for his bride. And God's love for his bride is a holy love, a pure love, an undefiled love. So 
when we or if we defile the institution of marriage, we're defiling something that is very pure and set apart and special to God. And so God forbid the Jews to intermarry with other nations. Now, very important. He told them not to marry these people, but he was not concerned with racial differences that had little, zero to do with it. He was concerned about spiritual purity. These people from other nations worshipped other gods. They worshipped idols. And God knew that this would then enter into their marriage. God knows that both a husband and a wife have great influence upon one another, for better or for worse. We even say that, right? And so God knew that if you take that step of marrying someone who has totally different outlooks on life and worships idols and other things, then you're going to have a problem. And we have so many examples of this in the Bible. I mean, you have Ahab the king who blindly marries a Phoenician princess by the name of Jezebel. You might call her a Phoenician blind. That's a different story. But it cost him his life. She was an ungodly woman. Then you read about King Solomon in 1 Kings 11. It says King Solomon married many foreign women. And then it says in verse 3, and his wives turned his heart away. So let me say this. If you are single here tonight, wait for God's choice. When you marry, you want to marry someone who loves Jesus, who loves God's word, that has a relationship with Christ, who's born again. That's so important because if you want your future marriage to be a battlefield, then you marry an unbeliever. But you, why would that happen? Because your allegiances, your hopes, your ideas, your destinies, everything is completely different, completely. And so it tells us in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So be careful who you date. That, so it doesn't start in marriage. Well, I'm not going to marry him. I'm just friends with him. We hang out with one. Be careful who you date and hang around. Because I, I've, I've said this so many times, so many times to People that are, you know, uh, being tempted to, you know, just say, well, man, I can't find any church, so I'm just going to go out in the world and whatever. And that's very dangerous. Listen, because you can fall in love with an unbeliever. It's very possible. It happens all the time. Um, but the consequences are not worth it. So the first sin is that they were marrying unbelievers. The second, though, is there were those being, who were married, and then they were breaking that covenant. And when the vow breaks, you've got problems, right? So verse 13, and this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. So God says, I'm rejecting your sacrifices. Yet you say, for what reason? Verse 14, Malachi says, because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you've dealt treacherously. You've divorced her. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? Again, Ephesians 5.31 tells us the two become one flesh. So we need to remind ourselves that God does a, there's a supernatural thing that God did. I always say this when I'm marrying a couple. God is doing right before us a, a supernatural work, and he's making these two one. And one is indivisible. It is. It's indivisible. So one of the best things you could possibly do is if you're first married, or you can do it now if you're married. You can do it now because you're going to be married, I hope, until you pass away. But you take, take a piece of paper, two pieces of paper, and just get them all glued up on both sides and put those two pieces of paper together. It'd be great if a couple did that because that's essentially what happens in a spiritual realm. You got these two coming together, and now you got one. And you just put that thing to a dry. You can just set it there year after year after year. And then somewhere down the line, oh, well, we don't like the way things are going. You take that piece of paper, whether it's 10 years old, 15 years old, however old it is, and now you try to take those two pieces of paper apart. You can't do it. it there's going to be rips and tears. It's going to be a mess. And those of you who unfortunately have had to go through divorce, which could possibly be half of this room, you know, you know what that's like. Just the devastation because of it. 
But God wants us to stay together. He even adds in verse 15, and why? He seeks a godly offspring. He wants us to have children and have them walking in the ways of the Lord too. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. Don't seek divorce. For the Lord God of Israel says, verse 16, he hates divorce. It covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Now, there are a few things that God says in his word that he hates. You know, he hates sin. He hates pride. He hates divorce. Why? Because it represents his love for the church. And this is how God feels when someone turns and walks away from him. It, it, it breaks his heart, and this breaks his heart. Now, moving on, God dresses another group of people. There were a group of people also here where, that were kind of frustrated. We, we, we're kind of frustrated, God. Here we are, you know, in the land. But why should we continue following you? Because we see people living ungodly lives and they seem to be prospering. Look at verse 17. You've wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, in what way have we wearied God? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in him. In other words, God seems to be blessing the wicked. Where is the God of justice? Does it seem fair, God? And sometimes we are even tempted to say, well, look at me, I'm seeking to try and do the right thing, the right thing, and yet it just doesn't go right, and then this person's not even following the Lord, and listen, God is just. And God, listen, God, just because God doesn't punish someone right away doesn't mean he's not gonna punish sin, he will. Listen, God is long-suffering, he's very patient, he's long-suffering. Oh, I don't know if I like that. Well, you ought to like that, because that's how he is with you. I am so thankful that God didn't zap me, right? I'm sure there are people looking at that wrong. I mean, he seems like he's doing right. He's, a blow. he's living this holy, ungodly life. And yeah, I'm glad that God didn't bring punishment on me. He saved me. So we don't ever want to compare ourselves even with people in the world. That's a foolish thing to do. Now we come to chapter three. And in the first five verses, Malachi prophesies about the coming Messiah. In fact, he talks about two messengers, interesting enough. Verse 1, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. That's a reference, as we know now, to John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. In Mark 1, 3, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And in ancient times, of course, we know a messenger or literally a herald of the king would go before the people telling, make preparations, the king is coming. So that's the first messenger. But then we have a second messenger. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger, capital M of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he, capital H, is coming, says the Lord. This second messenger is none other than Jesus Christ. But this passage is not a reference to his first coming. Even though he talks about the John the Baptist first, yes, Christ will come after him, but this is a, re a reference to his second coming. Because we read in verse two, but who can endure the day of his coming when he comes? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. You see, he's coming to refine, to purify, to make righteous. In his second coming, Jesus, of course, came to die, but he came in humility. The second time he comes, he's coming in glory. Revelation 1.14 says his face and his head are like white as snow, his eyes burning like fire, a sharp two-edged sword is coming out of his mouth. Verse three of, of Malachi tells us he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that, he may, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now when a refiner is refining metal, he does so to heat it up so that the dross comes to the top, all the alloy, that which is no good, and he removes it. And when Christ comes again in his glory, he will remove the dross. He will deal with the sin. He will remove those who reject him. And then he will bring in those who love him and set up his kingdom. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. 
And I will come near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who exploit earners, wage earners, against those who take advantage of widows and orphans, against those who turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. So I will punish the ungodly and bless those who love me. Now, moving on, he comes and he talks to the present time, to the people. And he says, for I'm the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. So you've been doing all these things that are wrong, and you should be happy that I don't judge you, that you're not consumed. And why is that? Because I'm immutable. Uh, The word immutable means I change not. That's one of God's attributes, his immutability. Now, we change often. We're very fickle. We're very emotional. Oh, you got to deal with that person. Or, Or we change back and forth. We're very capricious. God is not. God's character never changes. So he never stops being patient. He never stops being gracious. Yes, he is always just. He is always righteous. But we're thankful that in his graciousness, we're not consumed. And God says, I've been patient with you. I haven't consumed you. He says in verse seven, yet from the days of your fathers, you've gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. But you keep departing again and again. I'd send you into captivity. You come back, you serve me. Uh, Nehemiah goes away. You go back to your ways again. What's going on? Return to me, verse seven, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. So come back to me. But you said, in what way shall we return? Really? You need to give me some examples? So Malachi says, okay. I'll give you some examples. This is how you return to the Lord because you've gone off in some other areas as well. Come back to God in honoring him with your giving. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. And you say, well, hold on a second. In what way have we robbed you, God? In your tithes and offerings. Now, the word tithe means a tenth. Interesting, before the law of Moses, before the law was even established, Did you know that Abraham gave a tenth to the high priest Melchizedek? Now, once God instituted the Mosaic law, it was tithes, uh, plural. Uh, The people gave about 33% with all the different types of tithing and giving they had to give. People often ask today, are we required to give a tithe? The answer is no. We do not find this mentioned specifically, the tithe in the New Testament. However, I do like to always point out before the, even the law, Abraham gave a tenth. So when people ask, well, how much should I give? I, I think 10% is a good benchmark. It's a good place to fall on. But ultimately, here's what you need to deal with. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, not of necessity. God loves a cheerful or joyful giver. So you're not giving because you have to. Ah, oh, man, I gotta give. Then God says, don't give. You know, don't give to God. Well, yeah, here you go, God. You know, don't. So God doesn't need our money. We're the ones that should give back to him because he's done so much for us. But here's the truth. Everything we have, 100% of what we have, of our income and our possessions and our abilities was given to us by God. Now, people say, hold on a second, Pastor Ron. I worked very hard to earn what I've got. Who gave you the ability to do what you do? Who gave you the mind to think? Who gave you the hands to work? Who gave you the ability? Who gave you the opportunity? God. Everything. So it's amazing, though, how even Christians, they don't want to give to God. Listen, when I was first saved, I shared this before. I first saved, I'm like, I don't need to give money to God. I mean, he's got everything anyway, you know. That's, I was very just, I, I was just newly born again, you know, two, 22 years old. And I learned, you know, but now I've learned. So I, at first I was afraid to give to God. How, how can I take care of my bills? I was afraid to give to God. Now I'm afraid not to give to God <laughs> because God has done so much. It's like, oh no. But uh, one person wrote, you know, in medieval times, uh, when whole armies were converted to Christianity, he writes, often when the soldiers were water baptized, they would be water baptized in their armor, but they would keep their sword out of the water. Uh, it was a means for them justifying the fact that they would be yielding their sword in brutality against other people. 
And then they write in the same way. I think there are Christians who, when they're getting water baptized, they hold their wallets out of the water <laughs> because they want to trust God with everything except their money. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> I laughed when I read that. Uh, Luke 6, 38, Jesus says, Give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your life. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So he goes on to say, if you give sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. So the people of Malachi's day were, were refusing to do so. God, so God says, you're cursed with a curse. You're not giving to God, so God has cursed you. You've got leanness. For you've robbed me even in this whole nation. So what does God say to do? Verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me. I like that. Test me is what it means. I, God says, I challenge you. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be even room enough to receive it. People go, man, I like that. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail the fruit, bear fruit for you of the field, says the Lord of hosts. So God says, I'll take away the leanness and I'll bless you greatly. And all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord. So I, I do like this, that God says, put me to the test. I dare you. And, and I remember taking up that dare from God. Someone had said that, I'm like, okay. I'm going to do that. And so I, I'm just going to put it off on you. I, man, the first time I heard that was almost 40 something years ago. So, you know, test God, take, take this amount that, that really is a sacrifice to you. If, if it's, if it doesn't, if it's not a sacrifice, it really doesn't cost you. And it's really nothing, but a sacrifice say, okay, God, I'm going to do this. I'm setting out this to do and see what God does. Just do it on your own. Just see what God does. I think you'll be amazed. It's a great thing because look at God. I'm, you said challenge you. Okay, I'm challenging you. Let's see what you're going to do, you know. God is not a liar. He, he doesn't change as we saw. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, moving on, God deals with another problem they had. That was their service. Look at verse 13. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yeah, you say, what have we spoken against you? He says, you have said, it's useless to serve God. What profit is if we've kept the ordinance and we've walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed, but those who do a wickedness, they're raised up. What worth it is it you know, to serve you? And like, people are blessed, people are not blessed. It's all the same thing all the time. So essentially, what's the use in serving? Nothing ever changes. What a sad outlook. Listen, we serve the Lord because we love him. Now, here's the thing. Conversely, if, if I'm not serving the Lord, to me, that, that says that he's not important to me. It's just not important to me. I, I love Matthew 8, 14. It tells us that when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother, so that's, that's Peter's mother-in-law, was sick and had a fever. And it tells us that Jesus touched her hand and the fever left and she served him. I love that. In other words, the first thing she did, listen, when you're touched by the master, the first, the natural thing is to want to serve him. What can I do? I was touched by Jesus. He has changed my life. I want to serve him. It's the natural response. So God confronted them for their lack of service. Now, in the remaining of these verses, he has some encouraging words. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. God responds when we respond properly. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate in his name. There is a book of remembrance. God tells us there is a book like that. By the way, there's a book that records everything. Uh, that could be a frightful thing, by the way, if you're an unbeliever. Because it's not just for the believer. There's, there's books, the Bible says, books. In Matthew 12, 36, Jesus said, every idle word that men speak, they'll give an account of it on the day of judgment. Boy, that's scary. But we also read in Philippians 4, 3, that there is a book where our names as believers is written. It's called the book of life, and we will be rewarded. 
So Malachi is simply encouraging the people, listen, God sees the good that you do, and he's recording it. He's remembering it. And he says in verse 17, in fact, they shall be mine, says the Lord. On that day, in fact, my children, I will make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteousness and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. So God, in the end, distinguishes those who love him and those who do not. But I love this beautiful statement. Though we sin, though we're imperfect, though we blow it just like they did, when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, he forgives us of our sins and makes us jewels. I mean, think about this. Think about if you were going to have a crown for a king. I mean, I just think about the crown jewels over in England. I mean, that, those, those, they have several of them, by the way, lots of different crowns. And, and there are huge diamonds. Some of the biggest diamonds in the world are encrusted there. They're priceless just individually of themselves. They're encrusted all over this thing. But if you were to make a crown for the king of kings and the lord of lords, I mean, you would have nothing but the very best. And what God is saying is the king of kings and lord of lords says, I'm going to make you, you're my jewels. You're my jewels. You're my gems to, to sparkle throughout eternity with me. Wow. Wow. Now, we come to chapter 4, and Malachi prophesies about Christ's second coming. He says, for behold, the day is coming. This is God's, this is Jesus coming in his final judgment to establish his righteousness and make us his jewels, right? But notice he says, the day is coming, burning like an oven. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, it says, the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. As it says right here, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. That's sad. They will leave them neither root nor branch. But you who fear my name, the believers, those who are going to be my jewels, the son of righteousness, notice the capital S referring to Jesus Christ, shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat as stalled calves. So you're going to be blessed beyond measure throughout eternity. Now, what does this mean that Jesus comes with healing in his wings? Well, again, he uses this description as being a son, the son of righteousness. And as these beams go forward, as wings, as rays, they shine forth. And this is exactly what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. In Revelation 1-7, it says, every eye will see. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And he's going to penetrate the earth with his unending glory. In verse 3, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. This is fulfilling God's word, the fulfillment of the law and of truth. Christ will come. He would judge the ungodly. And then we have another interesting prophecy concerning his first and second coming. And behold... I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So before Jesus comes, Elijah will come. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now this has a dual fulfillment. First, in the Lord's first coming, right? John the Baptist fulfilled this in a figurative sense. The angel actually told his father, Zacharias, while he was in the temple, Luke 1, 17, he is, your son John is going to go before the Messiah in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. Later, the disciples asked Jesus in Mark 11, why do the scribes say that Elijah will come first? The answer is because Malachi says so. And then he went on to say, and I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, Elijah has come, referring to John the Baptist. And so Jesus said it again in Matthew 11, 14. If you are willing to to receive it, John the Baptist is Elijah to come. So he is Elijah to come in the sense that he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. 
pointing to his first coming. But its ultimate fulfillment is certainly Christ's second coming. Again, if you look at verse 5, it says, I'll send you Elijah the prophet for the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's clearly Christ's second coming. And, and we know that Elijah, in his flesh and blood, alive, will show up on the earth. Really? Yeah. Let's look at it real quick, can we? We can do it real fast. We got some time. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. So the last book in the New Testament. We're in the last book of the Old Testament. We're going to the last book in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 11. And uh, we'll pick up in verse 3. This is during the Great Tribulation. God is speaking, of course, through John. He says, and I will give power to my two witnesses. They will prophesy 1,260 days or three and a half years clothed in sackcloth. This is the tribulation is seven years long. The rapture of the church first takes place. Then a tribulation of seven years, the first three and a half years, times of peace under the rule of the Antichrist. Then he shows his true colors. It causes all the world to take him and worship him alone. All hell breaks loose on earth. We have the second half. During this period of time, we have two witnesses. They are two olive trees, verse 4, and their lampstands standing before God in the earth, referencing Zechariah chapter 4, which we looked at not too long ago. These are two special individuals. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed in this manner. And these have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. There are two men who did that in the Old Testament. They are Moses and Elijah. Beyond that, when Jesus appeared on the mountaintop in Matthew chapter 17, transfigured, who showed up but Moses and Elijah. They represent the law and the prophets. And so here you have Elijah who will literally be on the earth prior to Christ's second coming. Now you go back to Malachi chapter 4 and we'll close up here. Now to this day, even the, the Jews, when they celebrate the Passover or the Seder as they call it, they leave an empty seat for guess who? Elijah. Because when Elijah comes, then we know the Messiah is near. Unfortunately, John the Baptist did come in the spirit and the power of Elijah, and they miss the first coming of Jesus Christ. They miss their Messiah. But you know what? Elijah is coming again, but he's not coming to take a seat at the Seder. He'll be coming with Moses to perform signs and wonders, pointing to the second coming of Jesus Christ, that great and dreadful day of the Lord. When Christ comes, he will judge the earth, but then we will be his jewels. Amen? Ooh, I look forward to that time. All right, let's pray.